today's episode is going to be on the Hollywood legendary actress Betty Davis and her particular scandal. She actually had many scandals in her career because uh, she was a very feisty personality and she had, uh, you know, a lot of run-ins with uh, studio executives at Warner Brothers as well as producers and directors and her co-stars, her uh, main rival in Hollywood, I guess, was Joan Crawford, um, who was of a similar age, but also of a similar kind of personality, so they, those two didn't get along, but she had various, um, you know, run-ins with other co-stars along the way. So she was just this very intense kind of character, but the particular scandal that I wanted to read about was um, t in regards to the death of her second husband, Arthur Farnsworth. And uh, I could not find a specific article about it, that scandal. Um, if you watch documentaries on her, it's usually a part of those documentaries. And I have read articles about it, but for some reason on the internet, they did not have a specific one just about that. So we're going to read like a uh, bio, basic, you know, just a generalized understanding of who she was. You kind of get an idea of her character. And then I'll read the little excerpt from the LA Times, I believe, from 1943. And uh, just tell you about what happened based on, you know, what I've read from other sources. Okay, so let's begin. This particular article is from the uh, Express, the online magazine um, from the UK. So it begins, she seduced her leading men and left her rivals quaking with fear. Here to mark the centenary of her birth, we unravel the extraordinary lives of Betty Davis by Neil Norman. So here you have this uh, image of Betty Davis, and I guess she's most famous for those very large eyes. She wasn't considered a standard Hollywood beauty. They had a slightly different look that they were going for at that time, but Betty Davis was such an intense actress compared to the other girls who were possibly, I guess, more attractive that um, she was able to work her way to the top anyway. But uh, she did not have, I guess, conventional uh, Hollywood looks or leading lady looks. When Ruth Elizabeth Betty Davis was born on April 5th, a hundred years ago, her mother screamed, take it away, it's horrible. So much for maternal feeling. But it set the seal for the infant who grew up to be Betty Davis, a woman for whom it might have been predicted, fasten your seatbelts, it's going to be a bumpy life. When Betty died in New Ellie, France, at the age of 81, from uh, health issues, many of her fans refused to believe it. Of all the actresses ever to stock the Hollywood screen, Betty seemed immortal. She had weathered the storms of disfavor, flops, lawsuits, not to mention seeing off a quartet of husbands, resurrecting herself time and time again to the point where she became a living legend. Death was simply not an option. Um, so you can't really see a clear picture, but she, you know, this was, I guess, a slightly scandalous uh, pose in a, you know, in a bathing suit with a uh, hearty Albright. As things turned out, Betty was only human, born with none of the advantages that assist most budding young movie actresses, looks, and malleability, and one that was relatively unimportant to the Hollywood suit's talent. Betty learned from an early age that the key to success was to fight for it, and if the fight had to be dirty, so be it. After her parents divorced, Betty and her mentally unbalanced sister were raised by their strict mother, Ruthie. From the very beginning, Betty demanded attention. She was misdiagnosed as frivolous and spoiled, when in fact she was just a cantankerous, demanding, and highly precocious. She was also sexually naive, unlike her arch-rival, Joan Crawford, whose famously indiscriminate and voracious sexual appetite knew no board bounds. Betty was repressed and anxious about men. When a young actor called Henry Fonda kissed Betty chastely on her 17-year-old cheek, she thought 
she was pregnant. A few days later, Fonda was alarmed to receive a letter from Betty saying, I've told mother about our lovely experience together in the moonlight. She will announce the engagement soon. Not surprisingly, Fonda ran for cover and avoided her for years. Not that he should have worried. By the time Betty had turned up in Hollywood with a six-month contract with two Universal Studios, she was determined to become a star at the expense of everything else. Marriage, children, happiness, anything. By the age of 32, she drank for America and had had three abortions to avoid interrupting her punishing work schedule. A variety of husbands, with the exception of her second, Arthur Farnsworth, who died mysteriously of a brain hemorrhage at the result of a skull fracture, simply threw in the towel when they realized they couldn't compete. Of her last husband, Gary Merrill, Betty said, Gary was a macho man, but none of my husbands were ever man enough to become Mr. Betty Davis. So this is her accepting... The Academy Award. She won two, actually. Um, so it says psychoanalysts could make their careers exploring Betty Davis. Her mother was a tight-laced Victorian wannabe actress who projected her aspirations onto her daughter. Betty was only too willing to be pushed and ended up being the family breadwinner. She pretty much supported all of her husbands, as well as her mother's sister and her daughter, Barbara, who was born when Betty was 39. Barbara's 1985 account of life with her, My Mother's Keeper, makes Mommy Dearest, Joan Crawford's daughter's venomous memoir, read like little women in comparison. Betty never forgave her for dishing the dirt. And Betty has made excuses for her appalling behavior by claiming that she was battling against all odds to do the best work that she could. Clearly, the legend lives on in such films as now, Voyager, The Letter, All About Eve, Jezebel, Dangerous, and Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. Not blessed with conventional beauty, she was happy to play grotesque either internally or externally, applying layers of makeup and expressing extreme emotions, from the falling apart woman in Mr. Skeffington to the blinding and bizarre performance as a former child star in Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, Betty was fearless in her approach to unsympathetic characters. Unlike many actors who exhibit a need to be loved by the audience, Betty seemed to relish the reverse. The less sympathetic the role, the keener she was to play it. Her reward was two Best Actress Oscars for Dangerous and Jezebel, and eight other Academy Award nominations. In 1999, she was placed second behind Catherine Hepburn in the American Film Institute's list of the greatest female stars of all time. Undoubtedly, she would have had something pithy to say about that. Waspish and witty, capricious and violent, Betty could swing from mood to mood with mercurial, mercurial ease, a facility that made her a great actress if an unpredictable co-star. Once she had discovered sex, God's biggest joke on human beings, she set about looking for the love of her life. She found him on the set of Jezebel in 1937, but director William Wyler, with whom she began an affair, was married and refused to leave his wife. By the end of the 40s, she had a reputation for being difficult. When Joseph L. Mankiewicz announced that Betty would take over the role of Margot Channing in All About Eve, fellow director Edmund Goulding, who directed her in four films, including Dark Victory, wrote to him, Dear boy, have you gone mad? This woman will destroy you. She will grind you down to a fine powder and blow you away. You are a writer, dear boy. She will come to the stage with a thick pad of long yellow paper and pencils. She will write, and then she, not you, will direct. Mark my words. She was not above physical violence. During the shooting of the 1964 film Where Love Has Gone, she tore off her wig and began whipping her co-star Susan Hayward with its screaming insults. She wrested control from the writers and directors she considered too weak to do their jobs, but it 
was her fellow actresses who suffered the most. At times, Betty exhibited all the worst traits of Margot Channing, the jealous actress who would stop at nothing to get a role. Betty, however, had a different view. Margot Channing was not a bitch, she said. She was an actress who was getting older and was not too happy about it, and why should she be? Anyone who says that life begins at 40 is full of it. As people get older, their bodies begin to decay, they get sick, they forget things. What's good about that? Betty's most notable rival was Joan Crawford, an actress of a similar age who was everything Betty was not. While both had a certain artificiality when unchecked. Betty could lose herself in a her role. Crawford took a character and molded it around her own personality. She and I have never been friends, said Betty. I admire her, and yet I feel uncomfortable with her. To me, she is the personification of the movie star. I've always felt her greatest performance is Crawford being Crawford. That was the nicest thing she ever said about Crawford. There are legions of quotes. I wouldn't, uh, blank on her if she was on fire. She has slept with every male star at MGM except for Lassie. That makes for rather more hair-raising reading. Uh, another quote that she had was, uh, when Joan Crawford died, Betty Davis's statement about it was that my mother always said to speak good of the dead. Joan Crawford is dead. Good. So she just always had this uh, long-running thing with the John Crawford. The genius of casting these two old broads opposite each other in Baby Jane paid huge dividends. Even if the actual shoot was alarming, stories about the production have passed into Hollywood legend. The tale that Crawford, as the crippled sister, used to fill her pockets with lead weights so that Betty had to struggle to drag her across the floor, and that Betty didn't hold back when her character delivered several vicious kicks to Crawford's prone body. The suggestion by Ed Sikov uh, in his uh, biography, Dark Victory, that their lifelong feud began when Betty rejected Crawford's advances is tremendously tantalizing. Vulnerable and vitriolic, friendly and ferocious, Betty Davis was the perfect example of the craziness that often afflicts great talent. She had a remarkable self-knowledge and knew better than anyone where she stood in the eyes of the world. Having once remarked that when she died, they would probably auction off her false eyelashes, she would have been amused to know that she was absolutely right. They fetched 300 pounds at auction. Okay, so uh, now we're going to go back in time a little bit to 1943, and the... Um, second husband that she had married named Arthur Farnsworth. So, uh, if you recall, uh, Betty, the love of Betty Davis's life was a uh, director, was it William Wiley? It was Wiley anyway, the last name. And, uh, she, you know, had an affair with him during her, her various films, but he was not willing to leave his wife. And um, soon after that situation ended, like literally two days later, she left for Mexico and married the innkeeper of the place that she was staying at, this guy named Arthur Farnsworth. And, uh, you know, so it was, it was kind of a situation where she was, um, you know, completely upset, I guess, by the rebuff from Wiley and just was like, I'm going to marry the, literally the next person she met. And it was the, this, uh, innkeeper. And, you know, so I guess he was a simpler personality. Um, and he must have been enamored with her. You know, she's a big movie star showing up at his, uh, hotel and, uh, agrees to the marriage, but it was bumpy from the beginning because she had a very intense personality and he just wasn't, not only was he not a Hollywood type, but I don't think he was equipped to handle, very few people could handle her anyway. He was just not equipped to handle the emotional turmoil that came along with, um, all of her ups and downs and, and probably what was also happening was she was working, um, back-to-back -back films 
and you, the, you know, whether you want to call her a method actress or not, I mean, she might not have been employing the method per se, but she must have been bringing home the roles, so to speak, and she played all these very intense kind of characters, so, um, you know, I think life with her was, was a highly intense situation. Uh, so soon after, you know, when she, she married Farnsworth, um, I think she realized that this wasn't going to work. They were only married, I think, three years. And, uh, it resulted in this, uh, situation where he was walking down the street and just fell over. Um, and, you know, nobody knows what happened as when they checked you know the mother his mother actually asked for an autopsy and when they checked in the autopsy they found that he had an injury from a few weeks prior and there was an incident incident that had occurred a few weeks prior to that which we'll get into so let's just um let me go to the other uh, excerpt from the LA Times and uh, I'll read that and then we'll talk about it in a second. Okay. So here is the article from the LA Times, August 25th, 1943. Arthur Farnsworth, husband of actress Betty Davis, died at Hollywood Hospital of a skull fracture he suffered in a sidewalk fall on Hollywood Boulevard. The film star who had taken an adjoining room at the hospital to be near her husband was hysterical with grief and under a physician's care. The Times reported a Hollywood police report stated that Farnsworth, who was 35, a former commercial airline pilot, was found unconscious at about 4 p.m. along the 6200 block of the boulevard. Davis told authorities that her husband had fallen down the stairs two months earlier at their New Hampshire home while running to answer the phone. The newspaper said, the autopsy disclosed that Farnsworth had a blood clot on the right side of his head, which apparently caused pressure that made him dizzy and precipitated the fatal fall. The Times reported it is believed that the injury was suffered in the stair fall. Farnsworth and Davis, who were friends in high school, eloped in December 1940, surprising Hollywood. Okay, so... I didn't know that they were friends um, in high school, so she must have gone specifically to that hotel, so that d makes it a little different that uh, it wasn't the first person that she met, but that was how it was described in another article, that it was like the first person she met after the Wiley situation ended. Um, but it was, I guess she went to that guy's hotel in Mexico because she knew him, and then did marry him, but I guess did not understand that it was uh, going to be, you know, that intense of a situation. Okay, so now the weird thing with this um, particular case was when Betty Davis was at the inquest, um, she was asked, well, I don't, I don't actually know when it was that she mentioned this dare fall because originally she did not disclose this information at the inquest. Somebody asked her. Uh, the lawyer asked her, do you have any, you know, reason to think that this situation that occurred um, had anything to do with a prior incident? And she said, no, I have no idea. And nothing comes to mind. So she knew about the stair fall situation. She had already mentioned it to the authorities right in the beginning, but uh, didn't say anything at the inquest. The other thing is the jurors at that particular event were all fans of hers, um, so they were already kind of sympathetic to anything that she said, and she was crying, and, you know, doing one of those, I mean, you can say there was sort of a performance, but in any case, um, she was very careful about this, uh, previous fall. Now, the other situation that was going on right at the time, so, Betty Davis was, um, well, let me see if I can find a picture of those two in one second. Let's see. Okay, so this is Betty Davis with Arthur Farnsworth. And even in this picture, you can see there's some sort of an attitude issue going on with her. She's just a very feisty kind of character. And apparently these two were friends. 
fighting from the day one, but it was now like uh, three years into their marriage and she wanted out. The other situation was she was doing a movie called uh, Little Foxes with director Vincent Sherman. So let's go and see if we can find his picture. Okay, so this is Vincent Sherman um, and that's Betty Davis, I guess, on the set of this movie, Little Foxes. And she had a, a major fight with her co-star. I forgot the co-star's name, Marion something. Anyway, she had a big fight with her day and night. It was a very competitive kind of a uh, day and night referee situation. And um, at the end of the film, she uh, came to the director, Vincent Sherman, and said, you know, we had a little problem with Marion and you handled it very well. Probably he cut her scenes or whatever. Who knows what happened, how it was handled. But um, uh, she said, I you know, grateful to you, and I love you. So he said, oh, thank you, I love you too. Except she then said, no, I'm serious, I really love you. So he was shocked, but she was basically, um, you know, confessing her love to him. And I, I don't know if she really felt that way because of the situation that he sort of took her side in that uh, feud that she had going on with her co-star or what happened but she was married to Arthur Farnsworth it was just that it was you know a little uh I guess close to the end of their relationship she wanted out of it so she called um Vincent German and said will you please come to uh, Mexico come, you know, get on this particular train and we'll go to Mexico and have like a, uh, what do you call it, rendezvous or whatever um, over the weekend. So he said he'll think about it. He was a little taken aback by the situation that was going on. He then received a phone call from Arthur Farnsworth who said um, that he, yesterday she, um, Betty Davis had, you know, been drinking and she revealed the fact that she was in love with you and, um, she wants to divorce him and marry Sherman and, you know, he doesn't know what to do, uh, because he feels that, you know, he shouldn't be just divorcing people. Once you get married, you know, he, he wanted a situation that was longer lasting. They'd only been married like three years. So anyway, Sherman got off the phone with him and felt really uh, sad for him, basically, he said. And uh, he did not go on the train to Mexico. So Betty Davis did go on the train. Arthur Farnsworth found out about that train trip, thinking that Sherman was going to meet her for this rendezvous. So he kind of, I don't know if he snuck on to the train or how that happened, but he shows up at her private, um, you know, suite or whatever, and uh, they have this huge fight. The train had just started, um, you know, so it was running. It was not a maybe at full speed, but it was going, and Betty Davis pushed him in this fight that they were having, so it turned into, it was an argument, so basically Farnsworth was accusing her of, um, you know, gonna, uh, running off and eloping in Mexico, I don't know if she was gonna be, even be able to do that, but at least having an affair, uh, over there, and, um, she, you know, retaliated by pushing him. So she pushed him, she admitted pushing him to Vincent, to Vincent German, because she did end up having an affair with him. Um, so she said that she pushed him and he hit his head. And so she said that she believes that that was when he actually was injured. And then just a few weeks later, he then uh, got into the situation where he passed out on Hollywood Boulevard um, and, and hit his head, you know, the second time, but he had the previous injury, which was directly from her hit. Now, she never told the police that. She said that he fell down the stairs trying to get to the phone. And then um, she also said another story, which was uh, something that a jealous husband came and hit him on the head. So she was making stuff up, uh, but she clearly knew that um, he, where he had gotten the injury, and it was at this uh, this train ride. And, you know, he did not want to divorce her. I don't know if it was necessary for him to actually, uh, in the 40s, it might have been necessary for the husband to uh, 
file for divorce or something like that. It's not the exact same. I think their laws were a little different, um, you know, nowadays. But uh, the I, she did get, end up getting out of this marriage relatively, you know, kind of in a shocking way. Anyway, this did become a major scandal in her career because everybody you know, thought that something had definitely wasn't right in this, the way that he felt, and the fact that she had not called for an autopsy. She fought with his mother um, to have this autopsy done, so the mother was the one uh, who, you know, called and made a big deal and had a big argument with her. The reason she was hysterical wasn't necessarily because of the situation that he was in. I mean, that might have been part of it, but it was because of the constant phone calls of the mother and her coming to the doctor and asking for an autopsy because I think Betty Davis knew that something would be discovered in that autopsy that might possibly, you know, end her career, send her to jail or whatever. And uh, that was the real reason she was needing to be sedated and all of these other things in the room right next to him. So anyway, he never recovered. He never woke up from that fall. The autopsy did show that he had a previous injury that was the real cause of the fall, the dizziness, and then the fall. And uh, that was not going to be discovered without the autopsy, one. And two, Betty Davis did not tell them the real story of what had happened. She made this uh, falling down the stairs thing up because he did not go to the hospital or anything for that. Um, and, uh, you know, she never told about this train ride incident except to Vincent Sherman, who revealed it, you know, now, recently. So anyway, I think it's um, quite possible that uh, because of her violent tendencies, she, you know, definitely was guilty of aggravated assault. Maybe not direct murder, she didn't take a gun to him, but, uh, you know, she definitely pushed him, pushed him hard enough that he fell and hit his head. So, you know, I don't know if it was because the train was moving or, or what happened. Sorry, I'm a little breathy. <laughs> you guys, I, I don't know what it is, but uh, when the air is really dry like this, it's a little difficult to do a whisper. Uh, but anyway, that is a remain scandal, and I'm surprised that there wasn't a separate article. You can watch, um, uh, what was that guy's name? AJ Benza, I can't remember. But anyway, there was a show, Mysteries and Scandals. They had a show on her quite a few years ago. I mean, that's off the air, but it's on YouTube somewhere, and uh, so that basically goes through her uh, life story in a similar way, and uh, so she is definitely an intense character, um, you know, and possibly somebody who was uh, responsible for this guy's demise, her second husband, with without maybe purposefully planning. I think she disliked him and wanted him out of her life and was very impulsive. Um, but she didn't go out in a very, I guess, um, premeditated way. You know, she didn't try to premeditate the, the murder or anything like that. And she would have no way of knowing that the, the fall on the train would end up resulting, you know, in this. But then she did get out of that marriage, uh, you know, Conveniently for her, she did start the affair with Vincent Sherman, which was her goal. It didn't, um, you know, go, it did not uh, result in anything uh, because he didn't want to leave his wife. Um, she ended up marrying someone else. I think it was Gary Merrill, who was her fourth husband, and he was kind of a brute. Um, you know, constantly coming onto the set and kind of terrorizing everybody. Uh, so that one didn't work out as well. Um, and then she had a very strange relationship with her daughter, B.D. I've never read B.D.'s, uh, you know, memoir uh, of that, but I bet it's pretty good. I mean, Joan Crawford's Mommy Dearest, that story by Christina, her adopted daughter, got so much more... Uh, run for its money because of the movie with um, Faye Dunaway, but uh, nobody really made a movie. I mean, there must have been a TV movie or something, but nobody really made a Hollywood, you know, like a classic Hollywood film about Betty Davis, so, and that's possible because she lived until 1989, and um, Crawford had died earlier, so I guess 
there was a little bit of time while the daughter was still sort of, you know, uh, able to secure a film deal and so forth, but uh, that never really happened with uh, Betty Davis and her daughter, even though I guess the book is really intense, so it's something that I might look into at some point. Okay, anyway, so this was the uh, story of Betty Davis and um, the main scandal with uh, her second husband, Arthur Farnsworth, and just her, her general, you know, scandalous life of just craziness, you know, whipping off her wig and smacking her uh, co-star Susan Aworth. I mean, it's just like, who does stuff like that? So she's definitely got this intense sort of uh, reactive streak that was, she was not scared of becoming physical and it was, a, it was a, a situation that I think resulted in, um, this, uh, guy's, this, I, you know, I think he was a genuine guy. Um, I think he liked her, loved her, and wanted this to work, but I think she was just 